good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Um, just still seeing a couple of people signing in, so I'm going to do the polite stall for about a minute or two. Um, might as well start off by introducing myself. My name is Tim Cusick. I am the president and co-owner of Peaks Coaching Group. I am one of the four-person development team of WKO4, along with Hunter Allen, Dr. Andy Coggin, and Kevin Williams. Uh, the four of us, as most people know, have been hard at work at this for a couple of years um, and, you know, have been happy to get WKO4 out and live. We are doing a series of these educational webinars to just kind of help people along. If you've been following the webinars themselves, uh, last week, Andy, Dr. Andy Coggin, took us through a great understanding of individualizing WKO4 which allowed us for some looks in depth into the science of you know, what you can do with it, individualizing your training, individualizing your analytics. What I'm gonna do tonight is I'm gonna take you through sort of the application side. You know, it's funny, Andy and I always joke about it being an art and a science. Well, he's the science and I, I like to focus more on the art. Not that I don't understand the science, I'll be glad to share that also. In tonight's presentation, I'm going to be showing you some unique charts or reports. Um, I have them all packaged in a folder if you guys want them. Just email me uh, or email Peaks, it, just email info at peakscoachinggroup.com and I'll be glad to send them to you after the presentation. <clears throat> I actually think I could send them out just as your, part of your confirmation for being here. So if I can do that, I'll just put them in there. All the charts are in the folder, so it can be a lot of stuff. All you have to do is drag and drop them out. Uh, some are chart packs, some are charts, but then you could have everything you see here tonight. Okay, I'm going to jump right in because I think that's enough stalling. I see the, uh, actually I do still see people joining, but fine, let's jump in. Okay, so we're here to talk about individualizing your training tonight. To start that, I want to give you a little background. Uh, again, I'm going to focus a little more on the art and the application than the science. So let's just look backwards a little bit. We'll really start talking about all this interesting stuff we've done with data analytics and WKO and Training Peaks and other programs out there. We just have to understand that there's been an evolution of data over time. Um, the reality is, is that, you know, we go back to running and cycling and everything, you know, data tracking basically started with time, pace. It then eventually evolved to heart rate, and then it evolved to power measurement. Now, don't get me wrong, there's plenty of other supporting information and items like that, but at the core of the evolution of data are those three. Um, the reality of using time and pace and heart rate, it was trailing data. And since it was trailing data, analytics were very challenged. It was a very challenging process. Uh, you know, to complete analytics because you're really looking at an effect happening first and this data happening later, where power reversed that paradigm. Power is a beating. I push harder on the pedals. I produce more power, hopefully. So, and excuse me here a second. I'm actually closing the window to my office. Um, and it's given us the ability to really evolve analytics. As power came about, we really ended up with this on the bike power measurement allowed for some significant advancements. I mean, suddenly we had power meters on our bike and we had head units that gave information. It gave us instantaneous feedback to performance. You know, it's kind of funny. You, you didn't have that before power. Time wasn't, speed sort of was, heart rate sort of was. Power and some of the relating metrics to it are instantaneous feedback and have really been a benefit. Um, this allowed increased accuracy of data, superior post-effort analysis, and it allowed us to develop supporting measurements where we're able to compare data. And that's really important. If you look at a lot of what's happened in, in training, in endurance sports training, a lot of it comes from the fact is we're beginning to understand each other and comparative data. We're beginning to understand the universe of human athletes much, much better. So we're able to compare efforts, riders, performances, data, and stuff. Just taking a quick sidebar, because I see more and more people coming in now. Um, if you guys want to, in my presentation style, I do not mind questions. I should have put the slide in here showing how to ask questions. But in your little gray box, um, you have a tab that says questions. If you open it, you can type a question. 
I tend to stop at certain points as I go through the presentation and answer questions. Because I hate when you have a question right now and I go 10, 20 more slides on and then it's not pertinent. You know, I don't feel like I've answered it for you. So feel free to ask questions as I go and I'll gladly answer them generally as I go. Sometimes I might parking lot the question because I know I'm about to answer it, but otherwise than that, I'll answer it as I go. So back to this. Now we have this great data. We're gathering beginning analytics. We're beginning comparisons. We're doing things. From that, we have the emergence of this functional set of uses of data. And this is really where, you know, Dr. Andy Coggin and Hunter Allen and Kevin Williams, um, you know, we're at the forefront of this. I think what Andy, who kind of drove the science, and Hunter, which did an excellent job of application, really drove here is they made it functional. And suddenly what happened is this lab, this, this, this testing function went out of the lab. It got out of some static you know, environment and it went on the road. It became something that you could utilize and anybody could access at, you know, a reasonably low threshold of pain. Yeah, it was complex in the beginning and there's a lot of numbers and what was it doing? So we basically took this functional, we took this data and we developed a functional science. And that's what you're still using today. We have a functional threshold power. It's not lab-based, it's really just based on performance. You don't go and ride a bike as hard as you can. Somebody puts a mask over your face and you breathe into it and then they prick your finger and you bleed into that. It's just based on performance. You're on the road, you're doing this functional science. Normalized power was an outgrowth of this desire to be functional. We wanted to better understand the physiological demand of varying power. So normalized power came to life, again, making it more functional. Training stress score came to life. And this was a general quantification of training load basically putting a score to training load and allow us to functionally track that as we went. And then over time, the performance manager chart gave us more and more insight into how that tracking would go over time. These functional uses led to better, more customized training for the individual. So suddenly we've got this data and we're starting to understand people, the human being better. And now we're making this functional science so more and more people can understand it. And what was the evolution of training? This was in the early 2000s. It just became more individualized. It became more custom, actually, based on what you were seeing, looking at, and analyzing immediately post-effort. You know, the problem is, though, that's still based on a series of generalized rules. So functional uses, data observation, analysis led to development improved, but still generalized principles. What generalizes a lot of the training function right now that's in what we generally refer to as power training as a whole, most of it's based off a FTP, a threshold. So we establish this functional threshold power, this, this FTP, this threshold, this lactate threshold, um, most similar to lactate threshold, and we use that as the basis for a lot of the metrics, a lot of the analytics we're doing. It defines our levels. All of the training levels we based off are based percentagely off of threshold. It defines things like IF, which you know defines NP to some degree. <laughs> NP feeds into IF. It defines training stress. It, you know, training stress score that is obviously in a relationship to IF and training stress score, that's part of the big factor. Even your PMC, your daily input of numbers basically is, is based off a threshold setting. So the reality is all of the rules that we see today are customized, they're personalized, but they still have at their core this general principle. The challenge is, um, how do we move off that? The challenge that the general principle actually presents is not everybody fits in that bell curve. And whereas in this is a significant improvement in training, it wasn't the most optimal. There was still, still uh, something to be gained. We still had the ability to gain additional training effectiveness and efficiency by individualizing. When we look at a bell curve of athletes, you basically have, don't get me wrong, it was really well done. And it generally functions, you know, the rules function pretty well for a lot of people. But the reality is you have outliers outliers, which you might have heard, or heard to the term of normalized power buster. You might have outliers um, in 
Iron Men uh, tend to be outliers. You have these extremes, these people with unique physiology just, just doesn't fall within the bell curve. And even those who fall within the bell curve, we don't see this total um, ability to maximize the effectiveness. So really we have this challenge of generalization. To tackle this, we have to basically start with the principles of training. So I've seen five, I've seen seven, I've seen a lot of people present it, but you have specificity, overload, progression, recovery, adaptation, reversibility. And down there in the bottom, I put individuality. Obviously, we're here to talk about individuality. What is it? Well, the reality is it's pretty simple. The individuality principle is that differences exist in the adaptation to training in people, in the human being. Analytics are the key to determining individuality. Why is it such an important role in training? Well, if you took the principles and kind of broke them up, if you're a coach, and I'm going to talk, I, you know, most people here are coaches. As a coach, it tends to be the language I use. When we think about what we do in building training plans and working with athletes, you really have kind of three core things. It could be broken down into more, but you are doing diagnosis. You're looking at an athlete. You're understanding what makes them tick, strengths, limiters, performance, different stuff. You're applying a prescription. You're coaching, you're applying a training plan, a, a, an improvement plan, a psychological plan, whatever it is, but you're applying some prescription. And then you're tracking, hopefully, positive adaptation. If you start to think about individuality, right, and I know I'm repeating some of these because there's often ones that go across multiple categories, individuality isn't as much in there as it really is something that sits above all of the principles. I don't mean it sits above in the sense of more important. I mean sits above because it kind of works out in my little chart there that it's up top. But the reality is you apply individuality to all of the principles. It's something that if you could better understand the human, you can better apply the principles. So the reality is individualizing each principle is the key to increasing training efficiency and effectiveness. So what is individualized training? A simple uh Definition, it's training that recognizes the unique physiology of the individual athlete, allowing for specific, highly focused diagnostic analytics, training prescription, and individualized performance analytics to improve your efficiency and effectiveness. That's what it is. That's where, you know, so much of power training is going. We designed WKL4 as an analytical engine to support people's ability to do unique diagnostics, to dig into these analytics. Because we didn't, to be individualized, to allow coaches and athletes to analyze at a one-on-one -on -one level, you can't have a basis of rules and process. You need individual discovery and format. So what I'm going to do is take you through some of the things you can do with WKL4. I'm going to show you all of my charts on screen because it tends to make them clearer. Um, I don't, again, I don't mind answering questions, and I will send you guys everything that's on here. Um, request it just in case I can't send it out at info at Peaks Coaching Group. I'm going to break my presentation into the same three phases, diagnostic, prescriptive, and tracking of adaptation. So let's start with diagnosis. One key to diagnosis is it's a pretty simple process that's really complex to do. You really need two key elements. It's a specific determination of the rider's abilities, strengths, and limiters and the specific demands of the target event. I mean, that's just the reality, right? It is what we do. You have to take a person who wants to accomplish a goal. You have to look at that goal and the demands of achieving it and put the two together and come up with a training plan that works. When we look at diagnostic tools, we have you know, a little bit of pyramid of tools available to us, history, phenotype, power profile, power duration profile, and some specific analytics I'm gonna show you. Some of these you might have seen, some are new, but you start with history. Uh, history is always like a treasure hunt. You know, there's people who come to us and say, wow, how did you guys figure this out in WKL4? Well, we go treasure hunting sometimes and we look at data and we're looking for patterns and we're doing unique relationship analysis and stuff like that. So you start and you start in this treasure hunt and you see if it's going to take you somewhere. So one of the things that we're really looking hard at and working with and getting into charts at this stage and what we're doing. Uh, I think one of the strongest things since the introduction of power duration curve, I'm not going into the power duration curve, you guys. If you didn't see Andy's presentation last week, I would absolutely go to our website at peakscoachinggroup.com or go to trainingpeaks.com 
and watch it. He did a fantastic job of going into the power duration science and how it individualizes. I'm again going more into the tracking and application. So here's a very interesting chart, uh, MFTP versus CTL. And it tells us pretty much, you know, I'm going to use my Joe Ryder athlete. It's not somebody I coach. It's a sandbox. I, at this stage, because I'm limited, I'm only working with pro athletes who all have a data um, secrecy clause. So I can't show much of that. Um, so I, I'm using a, a sandbox group of data. The reality is here, you see this is a training athlete. We're doing a scatter plot in this sense. And we're able to take a look at as TSS per day goes up, which we typically would call a CTL calculation. This is tracking their modeled FTP per day. And then I've put a simple linear regression line in the midst of it. And you can clearly see as this person grows in CTL, their threshold still goes up. It's interesting to note that this particular athlete rarely in a year gets over about 80 85, maybe 90. You can see they're spending a little 90 time over CTL. So this makes sense to us. It's a little bit of a blinding flash of the obvious, but yet I can measure this slope. I can see what percentage gain that they're picking up for additional CTL. So if I was to look through multiple years of this, if I was actually clicking on my program, I can compare by holding command click down. I would be able to compare a couple of these years. I'd be able to look at the data they did and really begin to understand the history how much improvement in threshold does this athlete gain for improvement in CTL? Is it worth me going, convince Joe Ryder, you need to train four more hours a week because if we get your CTL up here, you're going to be 20 watts faster. So an excellent, cool way to look at history, MFTP versus CTL tracking. Another one of my favorite charts, I'm going to show you two versions of this, and this is in the default pack, you should have this is a comparison of CTL, TSB, and peak MFTP. So what you have here in the blue dots is you're looking at the relationship of MFTP to CTL all data. And that's an average, this is the same Joe Ryder. He averages, and this is 2014, so a different year, 58 TSS per day for this year. So he's not a heavy trainer. He's not putting in a lot of training load. And he pushes, you can kind of see it up here, same about 85, kind of tracking across for you about 85 CTL at the height. And we see his top 10 points of threshold, model threshold, come at about a 90, 79 CTL, sorry, 79 CTL. Well, that's to be expected. I mean, again, you have a light, somebody who doesn't have quite the time to train. Um, so the more fit, the more training this person can get in, they definitely seem to continue to be responding to the stimulus of duration because they're increasing. You see these top 10 performances out here, top 10 threshold, model thresholds, based on a higher CTL than average. That makes sense. And they get some of their best. They're a negative 7 TSB. So that means, like most riders, they tend to perform better with a little fatigue in their legs. They don't need to be totally fresh or they can be overly fresh but he's certainly not fatigued. He's not in the big negative numbers. Reality, like I said, for this athlete, this is a matter of gaining fitness and duration. You would project that if this person simply continued to gain CTL, they would continue to gain um, threshold, modeled threshold. So their threshold performance would continue to improve. But what if we looked at that at a high volume athlete? somebody who trains significantly more, can we understand breakpoints? Do we understand the relationship between um, high CTL training and performance? Well, here's an athlete showing the same data. The average CTL for a year is 134. Same report, different data. Their top 10 come at 143. And after I copy this, I notice it's hard to see, but I do happen to coach this person, so I know the answer. She spends a lot of time over 145 and a decent amount of time over 150, which would be about that line right there. So we see a point of diminishing returns. Training, we, and this is often a pro reality and, and should be a, a rec reality to some degree, depending on how much training, when I say rec, I mean a category racer or a performance rider. You want to drive to a slightly higher CTL and taper down. 
Well, I actually can tell right in this chart, if it was live, <laughs> I could tell you what the high points are, what we're training to, but that she doesn't perform at her best at our peak training load. She needs to taper down a step. That needs to come down some before we see best performances. And she actually has a broader array of best performance. You know, one of the things you can look at too is um, how these things cluster together. So she has a broader array. Her daily average TSB is negative 17, right? So she spends a lot of negative time. She's a pro racer, spends a lot of time racing, as you would imagine. Um, doesn't get that much recovery. But the reality is for her to pop off her best, I know it's a little hard to see, but that's a negative three. So this gives me really good insight. You know, this gives me some insight here to help a, somebody without a high training load, but it gives me really good insight for training targets and individualization. I very specifically know where to target this athlete annually. We've been able to test through kind of what's the peak, what's the point of diminishing returns. I'm not guessing, I'm working towards known goals. Individualization at its best, if you think about it. Sometimes we talk about situational individualization. So what I mean by, you know, situational history, really, but how that affects your individualization. We all know we train and perform in an environment, right? And that environment has factors that we often can't control. Terrain, temperature, elevation or altitude. There's factors, humidity. Um, there's things that we measure. I mean, think about how many people on this call, on this webinar, have a Garmin, and you look at temperature, you measure it, and Garmin wants to report it everywhere. Have you ever done anything with that data? You get altitude, and you probably look at it, but have you ever done anything with it? Um, what this chart is showing, and, and I built this with Joe Friel. Joe works on aerobic efficiency. He's written a lot of stuff on that. Anybody can go look up his articles and I'm sure everybody here is probably pretty familiar. So we tracked efficiency for this athlete. So the top is tracking their EF in red and blue. The blue represents their greatest 20 where they were most efficient. So you see it not happening here. You see them getting fitting. I could put a, a slope line on this and you would guess it goes up. Um, this athlete took some time off in the summer. So they missed a chunk of riding, but actually they were able to come back reasonably fit. Again, this is a, what we call a sandbox athlete. I just might not have that data, but I think you still see the pattern in it. But what if I said, was that efficiency affected by um, temperature? So I built a chart, binning. So here's the overall efficiency for all workouts. His fish is, average efficiency is 1.4. But now I binned it by temperature. Here's 60 to 69 degrees Fahrenheit, 70 to 79 degrees Fahrenheit, 80 to 89 degrees Fahrenheit, 90 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. I didn't go to 110 because if you go over 110 degrees and you're still riding your bike, you deserve whatever happens to you. So there's my chart. So he actually has a slightly lower efficiency at 60 to 69. He's pretty efficient. He's above average at 70, 79. He's actually at his best 80 to 89. But as soon as you start getting over that 89, look what happens when you get in this higher temp. Look how much the efficiency comes down. So if you have an athlete that's training in the summer, lives in San Diego, lives in South France, you uh, can predict. I understand what's going to happen to them in training and performance. Um, I use this chart for one of my pros. I was presenting at Training Peaks University. We were watching on the screen my racer race in 90 degree temperature and I already knew this person had a problem has a real a bigger decline than this in temperature very small small woman um, can't clear heat really well and I knew there was going to be a big drop off and it was funny we were able to kind of witness some of it in the struggle and then we were able to look at the power file from the race later and sure enough she just wasn't as aerobically efficient in that temperature so again excellent individualization in this particular chart, because I got the question a lot saying, well, what percentage of those charts? Well, it's 20, 20, 20, you know, 28, 20, 26. And clearly there's a small amount here. You're not having, this person isn't living in that temperature a lot, but that's there. When you get this chart, you can see scatter clot by elevation. Uh, the chart pack that you have will bend the same effects, aerobic efficiency and elevation. And I bet you everybody here would know that the higher you go, the lower your aerobic efficiency goes, but that's not universal. 
if we had 100 people on this webinar, um, the reality is the 100 of you would generally have, there'd be a pattern if I looked at all your data, but you each are unique. Some would sort of fit in the bell curve of the data and some would be outliers. And that's what this individualization and using this situational, using this ability to look at history, you're treasure hunting these really unique things. If I was training this athlete, I'd be super concerned about anything over 90 and their ability to train hard. I would also hear, just as some insight, I'd tell them to wear less clothes. Bet you 20 bucks they're overheating. Too many clothes. They, they don't like cold, so they overdress. Um, who knows? It could be a lot of things, but I would bet you that's it. Um, some of it's just temperature slowing things down, heart rate a little maybe, but bet you it's overheat. Okay, moving on to the next part in the pyramid with phenotyping. Andy again went over this in depth in the last presentation, so I don't want to go deep. We do have the ability to phenotype. Andy gave the science definition. I'm going to give you the application definition. Basically, phenotyping in its simplest format is grouping curve shapes as defined by the relationship of Pmax. How hard can you pedal for one, at least one full revolution versus FTP? FRC, how much energy can you expend above threshold in a steady state effort or in a, in a non-resting effort, I should say, steady state might not be true, versus Pmax, again, maximal effort and your FRC versus FTP into a common pattern group. Simply put, their power duration curve looks like your power duration curve, and we've just lumped them into same people. That doesn't mean somebody's might not reach higher. One of the things that I know people are struggling to get, it's the shape of the curve. And I could have put a power duration curve up here, but I would assume most of you guys are seeing it. And in this chart, you're seeing the breakdown of those relationships and what's making a T tier. This is actually Andy himself, so here you see all his years. If you were on the last one, you've seen this too. He's always been a T-tier. He's a very slow twitch, steady state rider. That's just his nature. His curve looks like other T-tiers, and it really is just a way of grouping and giving a common base understanding. We do have a, power, a classic power profile. It looks different. The reason it looks different, and I've already seen a lot of this, is you can customize this by times. Add your unique times, do different things with it. One of the things everybody gets lost in power profiling is they've got to exactly compare it. Am I moderate? Am I good? Am I very good? In the old systems, it was am I cat one? Am I cat three? The shape is more important. The shape of your profile. It gives you excellent insight into how you put out power, where your strengths and where your limiters are. And that's part of the diagnostic phase. I would tell you, I could look at this, at Joe Ryder, I could tell you a couple things about him real first. He's an all-arounder to a T-tier. He's got a, a better VO2 max is obviously his strength. I can tell you from experience, the relationship of his VO2 max to his threshold tells me he's not fully fit. He still has room to grow aerobically and get more fit. He's got not a lot of fast twitch muscle and he's got some limiters clearly down here. He's more likely to improve his one minute than he is his five second. Now in WK4, to better individualize it, we've introduced some new ways of looking at it. We have a power duration profile. And remember what I said originally, you gotta go back to the shape. There's a lot of people say, what exactly does the number mean here? It's just a comparison to the same here, but the number doesn't mean anything. The number simply is, we forgot to invent a way to take out the index in WK4. We're working on it so we could just show no index like Excel would or something like that. It was funny. We just didn't see the need, so it didn't get done. Now we wish we did it. But what I've done to this one, as you might notice, is I've run an average of, so I'm basically just did a, and it'll, again, you, you'll get this chart. I just took an average of the athletes, all points, all comparative points, and then I just took a standard deviation plot of positive or negative. So I can not only for me, and I particularly find this help, uh, helpful for athletes, showing it to them, to better understand why we need to work on some of their shorter stuff, why this is a key area for improvement in the athlete, and why maybe we can make this strength a little stronger, because it gives us a quantitative measurement. So if I was to start coaching this person, and then maybe a year from now, they've had a crazy good year, and I should have put up some comparisons. And that line looked like, you know, it kind of went straight across here and higher up. I'm a darn good coach, right? <laughs> I've earned my money. Hopefully that athlete stays with me next year. 
we have a good basis of understanding. In this particular sense, I'm using it as part of the diagnostic, but it's also part of the ongoing diagnostic. We can even estimate physical parameters. So here's Andy, he had this in his last chart. This is not an available chart yet, um, but it will be very, very soon. Um, we don't have the expression to make it work yet, but it, it's getting programmed. Uh, he's predicted, he's estimating his VO2 max over the last 10 years. You can see as he's gotten a little older, his VO2 max has declined. Um, he's also uh, doing his muscle fiber tight. He's estimating muscle fiber percentage. In this case, he's looking at a fiber area. He's looking at you know what percentage slow twitch versus fast twitch. So you definitely get some excellent insight, right? I mean, you're back in this history. You're digging through things. You've seen a phenotype. You see information. You do some, you know, all the way up to the specific. So you go back to what I showed you here. You have the ability before you ever write a training plan to really go deep, to look at these different patterns, to way better understand the individual nature of the athlete. So when you start writing that prescription, right, you're working on individualization. Okay. Using that diagnostic, I want to give you a tip, this funny little tip um, that we've been experimenting with a lot in a way to make the power duration curve really more effective. So here's the power duration curve. You've all seen it. Um, this is Joe Ryder's power duration curve. Probably has one bad second of data there, but you see a pretty good fit going through the power duration. You know, you see his mean maximal power working through. And you can see here where he had one long file. I couldn't find it. I tried to clean it out real quick today, but probably left his garment on, drove his car around for a while. Um, now, we have this traditional process where most people know power training. We go out and we, we test, right, at five seconds, at one minute, at five minutes, and at 20 or 60 minutes. The same profile was originally showing you. Here's a cool little experiment you guys can do, right? Test by the curve. What I'm going to call, and I know it's an oxymoron, unstructured testing. And here's what you do, right? You look at this curve in the MMP relationship and pick points where the curve is below. And then there it just happens to be, that's more like four seconds, as you can see. This one's right at 40 seconds. Here's a minute. You know, it's more up here. I want to see what's, I want to want this person to go out and crush one here. And for better or worse, this one's around 40 minutes. So what I can do with an athlete, and it works really well, because it also, there's a lot of stress around testing. I'm sure you guys have been through that with your athletes and stuff like that. They get test anxiety, right? They're freaking out about a 20-minute test, and I'm not going to do well, and I don't know. And then they don't perform well, and you as a coach have to be like, wow, you know, um, I know you're in better shape. You end up estimating threshold based off that, and, you know, you're working through it anyway. Take away the stress. Say to the athlete, hey, athlete, hey, Joe Ryder, here's what I want you to do tomorrow, right? Just warm up for like 20 minutes. Find the perfect sprint point. Find a slightly light gear, and just crush it for eight seconds. 10 seconds. Then ride around for like, I don't know, 10 minutes. Ride pretty chill, just endurance. Find a cool little short hill and then just crush it for somewhere around 40 seconds. Maybe not the same day. Maybe come back and try that one later. But you need to understand the power duration curve. Every point affects the curve. So if you want to make it more and more accurate, tackle the little places where it goes under. Our curve does not bounce across the top of peaks. That was a decision we made. Everybody, I'm sure, might have seen the argument about the power duration curve against the critical power curve. I'm not getting into the science of the argument. All I'm telling you is the difference is critical power curves tend to get calculated based off a more of a peak number and estimate your abilities a little higher. Is that an overestimation or what? Find out. That's up to you to determine. But you want to make your power duration curve more accurate. It responds to what I'm just saying now is unstructured training. If you do that over time, as that curve, as the mean maximal power tends to what I call waggle, you know, like some days it's here, then you push it over here, right? And this is going to go under. And then it's kind of like whack-a-mole testing, right? And then as soon as this goes under, you test this, maybe it goes under here, and then this goes. And that's you just to add as part of your harder training some unstructured testing, and you end up with a very accurate model. So cool little way to look at that, a cool little way to improve your diagnostics. If you inherit an athlete and you're just starting to work with them, they have like a big gap here and a big gap here and a big gap here, you could test those right away. If you're using WKO4, go out tomorrow and ride your bike that way. 
find one or two of your points, go out and kill it. Because it doesn't mean your th everything's going to go up. It means it's going to be more accurate. Every point in the system, every point in the curve affects your threshold. All right, let's move on to prescription. When we start talking about prescription of training, right, here is a classic. Um, I would imagine everybody in this uh, webinar has seen this zone. This And this is your FTB-based power training zones. They're Andy Coggin classic zones, as we call. And Hunter and Andy have done a lot of work on these over the years. Basically, what these zones do, these training levels, these were always meant to be training levels, um, is they give you a percentage of threshold power. Again, note, outside of neuromuscular power, which is really not a training level. They all give percentage targets based off a threshold, and they all have a fixed relationship to time. I have a power, a range of power, and I have a range of time to make these effective. Well, interesting there is um, if I took those percentage zones, and remember, they're bell curve. The reality is if everything's based off 100% threshold, right? That means everybody's going through the same transitions percentagely based off that threshold, even if they make power a little different. So if I took those zones and I applied it to two different athletes, so here's Joe Ryder, here's his zones, and you can see he's got a lot of space up here. He actually, his percentage zones, and his threshold is set at 240 versus 229. I set it at 240 to make this uh, comparison I'm going to show you. Um, so yeah, it's 10 watts off the model, but I'm more trying to make the comparison work because the next one I'm going to show is also a similar threshold. So we're seeing that you basically, this person is very flat here in the curve, but they move slowly through their threshold zone. But they move pretty quickly through these VO2 max zones and they have a lot, what looks like a lot here. Notice that the, the peak power is right about 800 watts so you have a scale of approximately 100 to 800 here. This person is a classic T-tier. Now if I apply that and take a look at a sprinter, look what happens to the sprinter curve. Now it goes off the screen because I fixed, I'm trying to scale it the same, 100 to 800. But since it goes off the screen, it kind of makes the scale blocky, but I think you guys will get the point. Look how quickly this sprinter actually moves through level four. They don't have a lot of curve there. Remember, that was longer and slower for the other rider, where they're actually, as they start going into above threshold performance, they're longer and slower through higher zones, and then clearly peak higher, stuff like that. If you tried to lay them side by side to get a view, and I tried to do this the best I could for you because we're going to two different athletes, you get pretty, pretty good feel for it. Look how quickly the sprinter is moving through this zone and slowing through here, but look how slowly this person moves around the threshold zones, but then quickly ramping up here. But yet, if you think about it, this system applies the same percentage. They both have similar thresholds. I think the model on both of them is right around 240, um, 230 to 240. Um, I know this is set threshold again, but it's not model. So in that comparison, so the reality is, we need to, and one of the big individualizations here is move away from anchoring everything to a FTP level. And that introduces the new eye levels. We're evolving training levels. There's still a relationship to FTP. We're still anchoring certain in a, in a way, but it's a combination now of your FTP and your power duration curve. That range is what you're seeing here. What we need to evolve is a limit of controls. So if you looked at them side by side, here's rider one in that experience. So here's their classic training zones. Their threshold zone in classic was about 237 to 276. And then here you have FTP and FRC FTP ranging from about 222 to 246. But then as you get into higher FTP and you're accessing, you know, what anaerobic contribution to making you know threshold slightly above or super threshold effort, 246 to 404. So we suddenly are seeing big changes, a, a more um, delineated, more 
zones more ability. And we're seeing now, once we get above threshold, because we understand FRC, we're able to apply optimal times. Look at some of these time ranges. So this particular rider has a very long transition from threshold into um, in threshold FRC zone. So the reality is, it's interesting, right? This is the sprinter. So I know people are going to jump on that right away, and this is all oh, you have to uncouple your brain from everything being based on a percentage. So a good sprinter, a good pursuiter, someone who has a good one minute and good anaerobic capacity, this person has about a 28 FRC, 28 kilojoules. Um, they actually can contribute a decent amount of threshold anaerobically. And the best way they're going to actually perform towards threshold is that they're getting that good contribution. Um, don't get me wrong, you're not, you're not riding it anaerobic, it's not what I'm saying, it's just you're able to tap and use that contribution, so you can bump along because your threshold's a little lower, your pure threshold's a little lower, but you tend to be able to do super threshold for a little bit longer. Broad range there, and then, you know, pretty good ranges here. You go back and look at rider two, similar numbers again that you see up here, look at their threshold, 218 to 254, so... I forgot, I use a slightly different, more different than I thought, but I think, again, you're getting the point. Here you're seeing it, um, look at what begins to happen when you get here, dramatic differences, 50, 70 watts. This person's more of a threshold base, they're slower moving through these high zones. They're only going to, we see a different time prescription, a best-in-time prescription for them. And again, you guys, I've seen two or three questions, but they're I'm answering them as I go. If you guys have them, feel free to ask them. Just click the question thing and throw them in. So let's look at the new zones here. So the reality is now I'm showing rider one and rider two. Look how similar they might look. Look, their recovery, 131 to 128. At endurance, look how similar they look. Now look at how different they look at going in these high ranges. Similar thresholds. But this person has a lot more fast twitch muscle. I'm sorry, this person has a lot more fast twitch muscle, gets a lot more anaerobic contribution, um, where this person has less fast twitch muscle and gets more of that contribution, is more of a aerobic. They have less FRC and less fast twitch muscle. So it's just, again, suddenly by making this unique, we're seeing an optimization of people's targets in places they target within the training zone. So pretty cool thing, pretty cool effect when you start talking about eye levels, and that's just something that works. Another thing about eye levels, guys, I didn't touch on it here, but I'll absolutely tell you is super important is all data contributes to it. If you go out and have a really hard ride tomorrow and you hit some personal bests on your MMP curve, that tweaks your model, that changes this. And it could change every day. It won't, well, it might. If you got off the couch and were riding every day, it would change pretty frequently. But that means it's immediately picking up micro changes in fitness. And since every athlete adapts at a slightly different rate, it's again individualized to that athlete because it's adapting as they adapt. That's really important. Because how many times have you been in a four to six week cycle with an athlete? And be like, oh, I think they're getting faster, but I got to wait for the next test. Or maybe I'll guess they're faster. And maybe I'm just going to estimate their threshold. Eye levels update as the athlete gets stronger, faster, better performance. Some of using this information, um, you know, here's a pretty cool one. It's important to understand this, then I'll make the point is, so we, probably a lot of people here have had normalized power busters. Normalized power is a rolling 30 seconds average. Um, I see some questions, I'm about to get to them. So the rolling normalized power algorithm is a rolling 30 second average. It's better represents the physiological demand of variable efforts. It's harder, it's more demanding to your body to go hard, go easy, go hard, go easy, than it is to go steady. And some people with high functional reserve capacity, high W, are normalized power busters because they can go hard, go hard, and they recover their uh, W recovery there is very quickly. So there's a chart. Here's identifying normalized power busters. So if you see somebody ticking over this line a lot, uh, they're typically a, a, a combined sprinter pursuitist. They have a very good recovery rate. I haven't seen one under like a 26 FRC. They always have a very high FRC. I've not seen any low FRC normalized power busters 
and you shouldn't based on my guess. So I can identify this athlete as a normalized power buster. Now for you guys that have been using power for a while, the problem with normalized power busters, right, is they screwed up this chart <laughs> because, and I can tell you actually, just to give you insight, that the red one was me. I'm the normalized power buster, so I know this one really well. It's been a, it's one of my things, and Andy and I have worked on this for years, and worked on the sense that I harass him, and he tries to figure out ways to solve it. Um, I can't use traditional threshold. In a steady state hour, I can produce about 275 to 280 watts. In a one hour super hard crit, I can produce 310 watts. It's normalized. <laughs> it's just me. So the problem is if I use 310 as a threshold, and then I go and do threshold kind of intervals, I can't do them. I can't do two toners 20 at 95% or SST 88 to 93% because I'm oversetting my threshold. As soon as I go steady state, I struggle and the resulting fatigue is huge. But yet if I use my steady state threshold for 275 watts based on that, my above zones are too easy and I crush them and I end up scoring too much TSS on intense days. Well, the reality is, that's why we invented eye levels. Think about what I'm saying. It's no longer related. It's not all based on percentage. The below thresholds are, I'm gonna show you why in a moment, but everything at threshold and above moves away from the classic anchoring of FTP and goes to, um, and goes to following and utilizing the power duration curve as the system. Okay, I'm gonna stop and answer the last two questions because I just want to be careful I don't get too far ahead. Is there a heat affected power chart similar to the elevation power chart based off individual efficiency? Yeah, it's in the pack. I'll send you. Again, if you don't get it, email me at info at Peaks Coaching Group. Joe and I spent a lot of time talking about, you know, efficiency, altitude efficiency, heat, effi all effects on efficiency. You know, in the end of the day, efficiency is a solid number if, for triathletes and riders. It can, you should never look at one or a small amount of data when you're talking about efficiency, just like power to heart rate. But the reality is you can look at the trend and you could even see in the athlete I was showing you, which I actually just pulled out of a sample set, you could absolutely see that person getting fit, what was happening to their efficiency and what was affecting them. So going back to talking about the eye levels, does it auto adjust CTL on the charts based on MFTP daily? No, it doesn't, but it will off of set FTP. We, uh, you will see probably very soon here the ability to just select use the MFTP so you don't even have to set and change it. We didn't want to do that at first because we wanted people to get used to working with it and using it before we kind of gave that option. Now that people seem to be getting pretty comfortable with it, it's a feature that's uh, coming very quickly. So that you could basically just, there'll be a, a preference setting where you could just preference use MFTP and then it will recalculate everything for you. So the goal is yes, to automate that. All right, now we're gonna go into some crazy advanced tips, right? So, all right, we've been looking at this and we've been looking at this charts and I actually, I think I have it here where am I going? So let's go back to this idea of Joe Ryder and the classic levels, right? Here's what Joe Ryder's classic levels looks on the power duration curve. But what does the power duration curve look like if I was to do eye levels? Well, there's Andy's eye level chart. Um, I should have done Joe Ryder's. I don't know why I forgot to copy that over. But again, you guys will get the point. So, um, and Joe Ryder's looks like this. So as a matter of fact, they're both TTers. They're similar phenotypes. So there's a reality to this. Look how much cleaner and targeted that allows us to target more spots, more places in the power duration curve and understand what's happening. It's funny, Hunter and I were talking about this this morning. There's dead spots in the classic. If I was to really expand this and just assume that you never end up working in. Where here you see this excellent range of recovery, it gives a coach the ability to be more descriptive and prescriptive in their review and prescription of training, right? So now the reality is though, if you look at eye levels, I know about, there was, you do have a range, right? And there's a time range and a what can be a reasonably broad power range. So how can you really zone and hone in? Well, you can do what we call power duration curve interviews. So this is super secret. You guys are seeing this before anyone. Um, so, and you are gonna get this pack if you email me and hopefully I can send it. 
not percentage, oh, I mean, I'll send it to you, but I'm going to try to send it out just as your message when it goes out. It's not a percentage of anything. It's based off the relationship of the power duration curve. The percentage of repeatability is going to be narrow. And it's something you need to test. We're working on a way to automatically test it, but it's something you want to validate. So everything I show you, I tested with, not with the sandbox athlete I'm showing you, but I use this system for um, my athletes. Uh, and again, I would show you my athletes, but all, I asked them all if I could share data. They're all very, you know, more and more pros are becoming data um, guards. They don't want their data anywhere. And I always respect that. It also has both some physiological specifics and some psychological stuff, what I'm about to show you. It really is a confidence builder. So you start thinking about the power duration curve, right, as a whole. So here's our red line. Here's a power duration curve. And you start thinking that people are out there doing intervals at variable lengths of time. It's actually easy enough to create targeting as a curve under a curve. So what I simply did based off, I took a power duration curve, I tested repeatability in an athlete, and I said when I'm doing intervals of Pmax to FRC efforts, so I'm, I'm going back to, I should have put this there, what this looks like, so I'm in this zone right now, Pmax again is not a level, just like, in the, it's just maximal, you really, it gives you some insight into time, how long you should go maximal, but the reality is it's maximal, so you don't, you know, it's hard to prescribe, your prescription is go 690 watts for 10 seconds. But here you start having true training zones, and there's time ranges. So what I do in the charts, right, is I test repeatability of efforts. I create a very tight high-low. The number of repeatable percentage is much higher than you think. It tends to be in the mid-90s. I create a very tight range. And if I was using the system, I could scale left and right. But let's say I wanted to do a 25-second interval. The high for this athlete, for Joe Ryder, for a 25-second interval is 530 watts. I'm sorry, the low for is 530 watts, and the high is 542 watts. So think about you're uncoupling this exact structure. How many times have you done intervals where if somebody has a hill that's only, I don't know, they tend to make it in uh, 43 seconds? Or you've never worked with that athlete and you want to prescribe highly targeted one-minute efforts, or for some reason because you, you go back and you saw a weakness in their one minute and 25 second, you know, you want to prescribe it. Or you just want the middle of a zone, you want to get in the middle of the PNOX FRC zone, which is kind of what I was doing here, I was just splitting it. You suddenly create a highly unique target. And I'll tell you, I've tested this, I've been the tester of the interval process for all year, um, and it works really, really well. It's, it's, it tightens the range of intervals so your athletes don't go too hard, too, or too easy. It also builds confidence in a way when you're sharing this with your athletes because they're like, wow, I can, you know, I've hit this other, I've hit that other, the system is saying I can hit it, you know, and you'd be surprised how with a little bit of confidence they go out and do it. It narrows the range of performance and it makes sure you're maximizing. Here's the shortest time I should do an FRC and here's the longest time I should do an FRC. Now, I stuck those lines in there just as lines, but just to give everybody an idea. But the reality is I can scale up and down this, and the up-down changes, right? You can clearly see it's following the power duration curve. So then I built a chart for each zone above threshold. So there's when I'm targeting my pure FRC zone. So let's see, I want to do a one-minute and 59-second interval that is in the FRC zone. It's more on what we call the extensive side, but I create a really tight target. For this athlete, it's 310 watts to 320 watts. Let's say I want to do FRC, FTP. You notice the lines are getting closer. Um, you would think maybe it would go the other way, but test your athletes on repeatability, and you'd be surprised uh, how tight this repeatability is when you start getting to a more steady state effort when you're moving down the curve. Easy, harder, easier to do almost, but harder, uh, I shouldn't say that, harder to do, but easier to repeat. So here in the middle of their FT, FRC, FTP zone, I pick a 10 minute. So I want this person 10 minutes. What am I targeting? Well, 243 to 248. Same idea for if I just want them to do FTP work. 
and that's always a little you're you're now getting to the point where FTP is intersecting you know the power duration curve so it's a little more mundane and Duncan I see your question I'm gonna answer it in one second finally why are the lower ranges under threshold why don't we individualize those well, actually, we do. The old system does really well. This is variance for those levels. Look how tight the variance is. You just don't see a lot of it. It's really close. We'd go through a lot of effort to try to give you an individual target, and it would be like two watts different. The reality is at sub-threshold efforts, let's just roughly say 95% and below, the variance is super tight. But as soon as you start getting threshold and above, look how big the individual, and when I mean variance, I mean individual variance between people between humans, you see it getting very, very big here and could be as much as ranging from 500 to 300%. You're talking about a significant change in power as a percentage of threshold, 200% variance. So you'd see why it's important to normalize this, you know, to make this individual, and this already sort of is individual, right? The classic zones, the ability to make it functional like Andy and Hunter did worked where it doesn't work as well as efficient or as effective as above. So the question I got was define repeatability. Um, we are going to go deep into that, Duncan, in one of the future ones. Um, there's two types of repeatability, right? One of the things we're going to start teaching people as intervals is the difference between intensive and extensive. I'm sure everybody can quickly wrap their head around what that means, but there's a different repeatability around for intensive versus extensive. But again, it's going to be something you're familiar with because it's a languaging thing. Intensive is maximal effort, long recovery, because what you're doing, if you think about it as a curve, is you're trying to move the curve up. So if I'm trying to improve this zone, you have two ways you can improve this training zone. I could move it up. Think about pulling it up, pushing it up to the ceiling. Well, the way you want to do that is do intensive really close to the line intervals with longer periods of rest, three to ones, two to ones, four to ones even, depends what you're doing. So four to one being four times the ratio. If you did a minute on your, in minutes, I would say as much as six to nine to one. A lot more research is showing the benefit of high intensity training with long recoveries. Something track peak guys have always known to some degree, but it's, it's showing some benefits. Extensive, and think about this, right? You could also move the curve to the right and improve the zone. So extensive is the idea more classically as we think about intervals where you're a minute 59 on and a minute 59 off. How you test repeatability and is your athlete is, and use my estimates, <laughs> that's how I did it. Um, I actually just started testing 95% repeatability. So I, this curve basically is the power duration. The blue is the power duration curve formula times, I forget exactly what it is here, 0.95 and 0.93. The range is much tighter when you test it. So then I have the person test that. And once they do one set based on your guesstimate, which would 93, anywhere from 93 to 98% is a really good starting point. You'd be surprised. Um, you will immediately know what they can and cannot do. You'll be able to look at the file. You'll see their degradation. And you don't even need a fancy chart for that, even though we are working on ways to measure it. But you'll see it intuitively, and you'll be able to say, man, I need to be 3% lower. And by the second adjustment, you usually have it. Because it's this is the model so accurate, it really hits the numbers that you know once you prescribe it and get what they really do, because they'll do one, I wrote a really cool article. I tried, I, I've tried to bust the model time and time again. And about three weeks ago, Andy dared me to go out and do a one minute and 48 second maximal. Or was it like a one minute and 28 second maximal? That's what it was. Just because I had a blip in it. And I actually posted it on, our, on the WGO4 Facebook site. And uh, sure enough, I couldn't exceed the, it was within five watts. As a matter of fact, it was within one watt, the first test I did. So with high accuracy, the percentage you start with the set point, and then you test what they can repeat based on the protocol. Okay, so repeatable for X number of intervals, how are you choosing X? That's a good question. It kind of goes deeper into the art. Um, I 
would say, so on my program, I have a go home line, right? So think about this. I could have showed you guys this. So imagine I run a solid line here <laughs> that's like bright green, and it's 5% below the low. So once somebody loses about 5% on an interval, then they're pretty much done. So often what I'll do, Duncan, to test what my starting point is, is have them do intervals to their power drops 5% below the low. Then that's, that's my establishment of basis in history, right? There's no better indicator than performance. But now I've got this cool power adding all these individual other performance points I can utilize based off one or two simple tests. So you can quickly start to see how applicable it could be because once you do that test once, the percentage of change isn't going to be greater out that much greater here versus here. All you need is one set of intervals, you know, somewhere in the curve up here, and suddenly you're going to know that athlete's repeatability. I'm going to tell you right now, the higher their FRC, the higher the above threshold repeatability is going to be. By definition and just by experience, that's exactly what happens. If the FRC is lower, um, I literally coach a pro athlete, a very successful one, world, former world champion. And uh, still looking for a world championship, a uh, second one, um, whose FRC is like eight. It's an aerobic sport, as Andy says, but, you know, repeatability of intervals and this and that, you know, you see it, same model applies, same thing happens. Without that high number, they can ride this all day long. You know, that particular person can ride at 90% of threshold for over four and a half hours. It's crazy, crazy aerobic VO2 max machine. Unbelievable stamina. Just not that much up here. So you begin to identify all those patterns. So here you see the same example. Like I said, there you see the variability. All right, so let's get in the final. I always want to try to keep these to an hour and get people off. Let's talk about tracking adaptation, right, and responding to athletes. There's this thing, and, and, and we teach all our coaches this, right? It's so important that you think about this to some degree. This is my bell curve, but I know it's not really a bell curve, so I tried to actually make it feel real more like the universe. So when you look at athletes, right, let's say this is a universe of a bunch of cyclists, and you could say triathletes or whatever. I just use cycle image because it was easier. And you have a bell curve. And in the middle, you just have like the average rider. And let's imagine out here on the left, we have riders with high FRC and low FTP. So here we have pursuiters and sprinters. And here we have athletes with high threshold, but really low FRC. Here we have time trialists and climbers. We have steady state. And somewhere in here, you have a mixed, right? So you tend to have an all-arounder. All-arounders tend to kind of live in here when it comes to phenotypes. And the reality is there's a lot more people in the middle. Not a lot. Who knows? Maybe it's 60%. And then you break out these people who have more of these extreme kind of profiles. Well, you pronounce it a little more over here than you do here in the world, but that's a reality of it. The funny thing is when you start looking at them and you're coaching them, this group in here tends to have a more, I actually used the wrong word, I should have used more predictable, it's never predictable, but a more predictable response to training. You apply a dose, you prescribe a dose and the response, they do the work and they adapt and they get the response that you generally predict. But the reality is, as you start moving out into the more unique athletes, you kind of go through two transitions. There are some people who are, you know, mixed responders, MR, mixed responders. And those mixed responders sometimes respond to, you know, you're, let's say you're targeting a limiter. So you're doing some training saying, oh, gee, I have to take this person who has lower threshold. And all we're going to do is threshold work. And sometimes they respond to it. And even sometimes they're just pure non-responders. There are just some people with a, they're just born to be on the track. And no matter what you do to build their threshold, you're not, I mean, don't get me wrong, you always move at some fitness pays, blah, blah, blah. But the cost benefit of doing all that work isn't there. And as a coach, sometimes you have to just say, you know what? It, it's not beneficial to keep banging away at that. You're a non-responder or you're only a mixed responder. As a coach, when you're looking at that adaptation, you're always doing a cost-benefit analysis. That athlete has so many hours to train, that's the cost. You're taking up those hours. And if you're not getting result, i.e. the benefit, if the cost is too high for the benefit, then it's not good coaching. 
Same extreme over here, high F FTP, low FRC. Some people are mixed responders, some are non-responders. I know Hunter's worked with Jeremiah Bishop for a long time and has, you know, for, spent like two years trying to, Jeremiah's very aerobic, he's very, he's this rider, tried to get more and more AC out of him, and it was hard. You'd have to put so much effort in for the return, it really wasn't worth it. It becomes a situation where, you remember the old adage, uh, which actually has a lot of basis of reality, you train your weaknesses and you race your strengths. Well, if you did that across the bar, this, that would, this would respond very well. This group probably would respond reasonably well. This group, wrong strategy. This group needs to be train your strengths, race your strengths. So it gives us some insight into response. So when we start thinking about this tracking, let's think about tracking of response in both a macro and a micro style. And some of the things we can look at is training load comparisons, training adaptation comparisons, performance comparisons. So here's a simple one. Here's that same power duration without the plus or minuses. I just left it nice and clean for everybody. And I'm taking Joe Athlete. I actually think this is Joe Ryder. And I'm looking at two different years, 2013 versus 2014. You could immediately see there's a different shape. Remember I said the shape is really important. So there's a different shape in that. And we could see they had some better FRC in 2014. They had some um, better stamina though, actually in 2013. See that little gap there. But actually in the end of the day, the gap that really mattered was their long stuff. They were definitely more fit. Their ability to, you know, 20 minutes plus was way stronger in the green year 2013 than it was in 2014. So it gives you the ability, let's say you just take on an athlete has power data for four or five years and you kind of know what their training was. You just, and by the way, to make this work, if you, you're not using WQ4, just command click, command click, command click, and choose as many years as you want to compare. Um, now I can see, and then I can go back and say, what were they doing different each year? So it really gives me the ability to track change over time. I use this chart again just to think about it. It also gives me the ability over time, this macro cycle review, I could change what's happening to your VO2 max, estimated. What's happening to your muscle fiber type? Um, I hate to say it, Andy, if you watch this recording, but you're getting older. So the reality is that's happening. His VO2 max is declining, and that's what you see there. So that, in this case, you're just talking about yeah, it's probably training based to some degree, but it's probably more just aging and athletic maturity. You can also look at a micro cycle. So power duration curve gets faster insight. So this goes back to the fact we were just talking about where it updates eye levels. The power duration curve gets faster insight into changes in fitness and performance, better allowing for the individual adaptation rate and response. Hard efforts immediately impact the model. It gives us insight. All points in the curve are important and it shortens the dose and response time gap. The dose and response time gap, you as a coach, you know, you're looking, you know an athlete needs to accomplish something or I need to get them a little faster like this or I need to do that for them. Uh, we need to get their time trialing ability up, whatever it is, and you start applying a dose, you go into a cycle and you typically need like two, three cycles to see is it beginning to take effect? Is what I'm applying, what I'm dosing, creating the desire, excuse me, desired adaptation? Well, in this system, you have a much shorter response cycle. And you could use that in a couple of ways. Let's talk about measurement of specific dose. This is actually one of my athletes, uh, crazy mountain bike guy. So at the end of the year, mountain bike nationals was over and everything kind of was over and he was kind of out of racing, but he didn't want to slow down yet. So I said, look, dude, here's what we're going to do. He, he's a good five minute, 20 minute, but he's not really a great, he wasn't that great of a one minute. He's strong all across the board, but wasn't that strong at one minute. So I said, let's just spend a three-week cycle and see if we can crush your anaerobic capacity. Let's do a lot of hard workout. Let's just go, you know, throw down some big hits, you know, and stuff like that. Because we couldn't do it in season because the cost of finding out. I didn't know. I just started working with him actually in January. Um, I wasn't sure what his response was. And I didn't want to take him through a cycle like this and exhaust him in a pro race season. So now that the season's over and he wants to keep riding and he needs to be busy, I say, ah, let's take a couple of weeks and find out. Well, instead of having to use 8, 12 and stuff weeks like that, I give him this specific dose. He's got bad data in here, but it's the consistent bad data. It's a device problem. I'm not even going to talk about the device, but the reality is just look at the shape. Um, if you see his one-minute time, yellow was where he was season up to the last 
it really is the last 30 days because literally this happened in the last two weeks. Three, I mean, completed the system in the last two weeks. Um, and then where he was, I could have clicked the last 30 days, but you see the last 90 days in red. Um, he adapted. You know, it's kind of funny, right? He just is. He adapts. He gets faster. His numbers are better. Uh, he jumps 60, 80 watts, whatever the number is, and you can see it. You know, you can see the pretest. We did a pretest, and you can see the post-test. So you see it both kind of moving up in the area. So wow, in a three-week cycle, he adapted. So that goes into my intelligence bank for next year. Next year, he has a bigger goal and accomplish more. I do know if I need to do a short-term cycle and tune his functional reserve capacity, tune his anaerobic capacity, I could move it in three weeks. I got a good idea already. He's a responder. I've done a short experiment. I've been able to measure the result. I know very specifically how he will respond. People tend to respond in the same pattern. They're very unique human to human, but an individual person is generally patternistic. So interesting bit of learning. Here's a really cool chart. Um, this is my shark tooth chart that uh, can be confounding a little bit. So what I'm doing here in this chart in the blue is I am doing a smoothed average ramp rate. So I'm running a 21-day ramp rate smoothing. So I can see what the rolling 21-day average is. And that's what you're seeing in blue. And what you're seeing in orange is the modeled threshold. This is the same athlete we were just looking at. So you can see in April, we did this, I'm sorry, in March, April, we did this massive push. And I had his ramp rate over, like right at 9.10. He's a very tough trainer. He, he went through a surgery an elective surgery here. So he missed a whole bunch of time and then he just came back and he's a very energetic, you know, uh, trainer. He just wants to go at it. So he crushed him for a little while, right? And he was a little bit of rest. You see improvement and then a lot of rest and look what happens. Look where his threshold gets on the move, right? Well, as we all know, it takes an average somewhere four to eight weeks to adapt to exercise. So is this rider, his name is Adam. What is he? Well, look, I can simply take that period of time measure the distance to when his threshold really started moving, right? I knew when I started the work. And basically, he hit it in about six weeks. So now I could have showed you, I should have showed other athletes. I have one athlete who adapts in three weeks after big cycles. I know Hunter's that way. Hunter adapts very quickly to power. So now what I'm, am I able to individualize about this? This is huge because what this is telling me by training load, by measuring the progressive overload of training, because that's what ramp rate is doing, right? How much overload I'm giving them. Not just training load, progressive overload I'm giving them. It's different, related, but different. How much longer after that do they respond? So when I go to this athlete now and I'm like, dude, I'm going to crush you. You're going to struggle. <laughs> We're going to, you know, do six weeks really hard ass training. And you know, you got to be patient for that to pay off. He believes me. And I know how to time his peaks better. See this here? Mountain bike nationals. Right there. Couldn't have nailed it better. Because I'd measured this from back data, by the way. I didn't just figure it out as we went. <laughs> So you talk about individualization and making, you know, performance more effective. There's a killer right there. Great chart. You're going to get it, by the way. It's nowhere else in the world. I haven't exposed this to anyone, um, period. You know, I've talked to Andy about the theory, but even Andy doesn't have this one. So you guys are going to be uh, ahead of all the insiders. Um, run across a couple of athletes. You'll be amazed at, at you'll quickly identify their pattern of, Remember, it's progressive overload. It's ramp rate. It's not CTL. It's ramp rate to adaptation. 
Okay, I know that's kind of an abrupt end. <laughs> you know, I was like thinking, what's the transition slide, but I don't have a good transition slide. But I think you guys, I gave you some interesting stuff. You've seen really some of this application as a coach and how this data, you know, can really improve your effectiveness and your efficiency in coaching. Um, you know, we've had some good questions and it's Q&A. If you have them, pile them in right now. Um, I'd be glad to answer them. You know, I know an hour and 15 of a webinar gets long. I was trying to squeeze that to an hour. Um, got close, but please feel free to ask your questions now. If not, you can always just email them to me at info at peakscoachinggroup.com. Be glad to answer them. My email's tim, T-I-M, at peakscoachinggroup.com, so you can email them directly to me anyway. Um, I hope you guys utilize and try these uh, charts and stuff. Learn. My final message to you is build some of your own. When we built this WKL4, we went through a tremendous amount of effort to make it an analytical engine because we wanted coaches and exercise physiologists and people to come up with their own ideas. Not that we don't have ours. You see a bunch of ours, right? But any one of you on this meeting could go and replicate anything here. We just, you know, we went on our treasure hunt. We just started thinking and we experimented and whatever. And that's the power of it, that this is a tool. You know, a lot of people thought we were creating this like highly specific solution. In the end of the day, we wanted to give you, the coaches, the exercise physiologist, the self-coached athlete, the athlete themselves, however you see it, the ability to improve and invent and make things, you know, that work for you. Excellent. I think most of the questions that have been coming up in between were answered. Um, that's it. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Have a great night.